Okay. Hi, Laura. Hey. Hey, so we're uh, back with the uh, Laura Brand Serial Killer Whisperer. Uh, last week, we were talking about Michael Gargiulo, because he is coming up in the news again, uh, because he's being charged, or he's, his trial's happening out in Illinois, he got extradited. Um, and um, it's funny, because like Ashton Kutcher's name has come up again. Yep. Since this whole Diddy thing. And there was somebody that came out that kind of made, was like making the case that maybe he was the one who, well, at least he, he either saw it or he may have been participated in Ashley's murder. Did you see that some people were coming out and saying that? I do. And I understand why people may think that. Um, because when he said he looked in the window when he went to Ashley's house, knocked on the door, yeah, the window he looked into, you would have not seen, you know, the blood splatter or, you know, anything that would have um, shown a murder, that type of thing. Um, so I understand, yeah, that's kind of like contradictory to what he's saying. Um, he may have opened the door. He may have seen it, gotten scared, walked out. Um, but um, one hundred percent, Michael Gargiulo did kill. Yeah, there's no doubt. Yeah, I just yeah. thought it just like it popped up in the news again, mm -hmm. or not even the news. It was just like all over the internet. Like as soon as his name was mentioned in the Puff Daddy thing, like literally the dead next day, they were connecting him to the yeah. Ashley murder. I'm like, it's crazy how that happens. Well, yeah, because of course, you know, one of his girlfriends is murdered in cold blood. You know, of course, with the scandal, the people want to connect it, but there really is no connection. Yeah. I can tell you that Michael Gargiulo is a cold-blooded serial killer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So where did we leave off last week that we were talking about? Thank All right. You. So we finished up with uh, Trisha and Ashley. Mm -hmm. and we had just started to talk about Maria, who was the third victim of him. Um, so I said the valley. It was El Monte where she was killed. So she had just separated from her husband and moved into this complex there. And it was a secure complex. You needed a, a key card to even get into the premises. There was about 80 units inside. And right after she moved in, she starts complaining to friends that this guy is stalking her. Um, and her next door neighbor reported seeing a guy with a black hoodie, black um, hat on, peering into her windows, trying her doorknob, uh, literally trying to break into her place when she wasn't there. So she was being stalked well before she was even killed. Mm -hmm. the night did, he, did he actually tell you that that's what he used to do or did he reveal any of that information? He said the same thing as Bitteker. Like he would go and like kind of peep Tom type of stuff, like the, the night crawler stuff, you mm -hmm. know, teenage years, um, which is very typical for serial killers. They kind of start with this stalking behavior very early on peering into windows you know this is where the fantasies start to emerge yeah and yeah well even like trying to you know strike up a conversation with their victim ironically well yeah i mean michael did know trish and he did infuse you know himself into ashley's life you see him lurking in the background of her pictures with her friends it's like at like a selfie with the pictures of her and her friends and you see this creepy guy yeah, it's very eerie. Um, same thing happened to Maria. Um, she had she wasn't even in there 10 days, and she was just constantly complaining to friends that this guy was just following her around. She brought in um, some groceries into her house, left the door open, mm -hmm. he followed her into her home, her like apartment even. She was like, can you get out of my apartment? Mm -hmm. And even the neighbor complained to the landlord that this guy was trying to get into her place and constantly peering into her windows before the murders. Yeah. So creepy. It is. And he was actually living with his second baby mama, who was pregnant at the time, too, while this was happening. Gargiulo so, had a second baby mama? Mm-hmm. Yep. He was living in her apartment during the murders. Wow. Mm-hmm. Was she, was she part of the investigation? Did she testify against him at all? She did. She was called into court. Wow. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So the night of Maria's murder, she went out with her husband who she was separated from. They went out to a restaurant. They were drinking until late. I think it was like 1 or 2 a.m. They came back to her apartment. They had intercourse. He left. He left around 3 a.m., he reports. So the next day, he actually came to the apartment, knocked on the door. He was the one who discovered her uh, murdered. So there was a very short time frame from when she was actually killed from 3 a.m. to early in the morning. Um, and it was a really vicious killing. The body once again was posed. The one thing that was, was it posed. Um, part of her body was put in her mouth. Oh, OK. Mm -hmm. She was kind of like laid out. Um, oh. Ritualistic, just like kind of like Trish and Ashley were. Um, yeah. I won't go into the graphic details, but that's fine. I mean, did he did he explain to you why he liked to pose them? Well, I'm going to go into my interviews with him after oh, okay. I a little bit more because. Got it. All right, I, I I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um. So she was found, and he called 911. Um. The police ruled out her ex husband right away, um, and then they start canvassing. You know, the 80 units. And the neighbor comes forward right away saying this guy was stalking her. Um, the one thing taken from her was her keys. They never recovered her keys, which is also kind of interesting because with Trish, the keys, when she was trying to get into the house, were found like gripped in her hand. So there's something like weird with, you know, Trish is found kind of sprawled on the stairs. So was Ashley. Keys in the hand. Then the keys are taken from the only thing taken from Maria's scene were her keys. Yeah. From both victims? Just Maria. Just Maria. Yeah. And so with uh, Maria's murder, there was a piece of evidence found. There was no DNA, no evidence found at Ashley's scene. At Trisha's uh, murder scene, you know, her, they found Michael Gargiulo's DNA under her fingernails. Mm -hmm. But the DA did, decided not to you know, move on with the case and press charges at that time. With Maria, there was a blue booty, like one of those workers' booties, like the, you know, when you're going to paint or whatever, was found um, actually in the courtyard in between her apartment and his. And there was DNA found within that blue booty of the attacker. So wait a minute. I mean, back up. So you're saying there was all that evidence and they chose not to prosecute him for this? Correct. Correct. So that woman's family has no justice? Well, there's, now they do. I mean, now it's a trial. But originally, so when, when did they actually prosecute? Did they eventually prosecute him for it? Patricia? It's happening now. Oh, Patricia, yeah. 30 years later? Yeah. Yeah, because 1993, 2024, yeah. 31 years later. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. It's really crazy. Yeah. So um, the blue booty was found in the courtyard with DNA. So they take that. It's their only big, you know, key piece of evidence. They test it. They find it comes back to a case in Illinois. Um, same DNA, DNA from Trisha. So he's still um, eluding police. He is now, uh, you know, the baby mom, second baby mama broke up with him. He met another girl because he's just moving from apartment with finding girls he can move in with. So that yeah. was a big thing is like police were unable to track him because he had no address. There's no address. And he's using their cars. It was very he's using hard. Their phones. He's using everything. Right. No paper trail. Wow. So he moves in with her and her mother in Santa Monica. And this comes. So when he moves into Santa Monica, then he starts uh, stalking a 26 year old female named Michelle. Um, she was living alone, one bedroom apartment, very nice area of uh, Santa Monica. And it was around, um, I think it was a little after 10 or 11 PM. Um, he broke into her place, same way he broke into Maria's. He would cut the screens mm -hmm. going through the window. Uh, and Michelle woke up to a man on top of her stabbing her in the chest. Wow. Yeah. Um, she started fighting. Um, 
Uh, she put her hands up. She suffered severe, severe wounds to her hands from defensive wounds. Thankfully, she was small. She was only like 5'1", and she was able to scoot her body and actually kick him off of her. Wow. And as she did so, he felt back, and he got up, and he actually said, I'm sorry, and ran out of the apartment. Yeah. Um, but before this happened, it was a it was a big struggle. And he actually suffered a night wound himself. So as he ran out of her apartment in Santa Monica, his uh, wound from his hand was actually dripping blood all over her apartment, all the way down the stairs and nearly back to his own apartment. Oh, wow. Yeah. How far did he live from there? Like walking distance? Yeah. Yeah, because he was always close to his victims. That's why he's labeled like the boy next door killer. Because mm -hmm. he's literally next door. Yeah. Investigators come, they test the blood, comes back to the same guy who killed Trisha, who killed Maria. But now they have enough to finally, or the, at least the DA finally feels they have enough to arrest him yes. and bring him in. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. So they finally bring him in. and um, needed a larger body count in order to charge him? It's, it's really crazy. I mean... You know, after they found Trisha with Ashley, they connected the dots. You know, they should have really brought him in after that. You know, because Maria would still be alive. Michelle would have never been attacked, you know, alone in her bedroom at night. And there were some missed attacks, too, where he had actually tried to break in. Like a girl was sleeping on her couch, but awoke and actually, like, scared him off. So there was a lot of other murders that um, were about to happen, you know, in the commission of crimes. Um, and what I'll get into in a little bit is some of the things he's told um, the death row mm -hmm. inmates, as mm -hmm. well as some people in, in, in the county jail once he gets arrested. So he gets arrested, he gets brought into Santa Monica. And, um, you know, he freezes up, he doesn't say anything to the cops, but they put him back in the holding cell. He finally goes to Los Angeles County. Mm -hmm. And like so many inmates, they just start talking. And what I did not know until I started researching the case a little bit more is what he was telling the inmates in Los Angeles County was almost identical to what he was telling the guys in San Quentin, mm -hmm. which I thought was like, wow. So I had listened to um, one of the detectives came forward and said, we have information that he's killed seven other girls um, from because he would drive back and forth from Illinois to Los Angeles. That's what he was bragging about in, in jail and in prison. In county. So when the death row inmates called me, they said, Laura, you've got to be looking into um, the routes from Illinois to Los Angeles. They go, there's there's girls. He's killed girls from there. All right, so you're getting inside information from the other serial killers there. They're kind of giving you a heads up on yeah, where to look, where to go. Because because he's telling them more information than he's telling you. So I had no idea he had told the same thing to the inmates in county as well. Um, the only difference was he told the guys in county seven. He told the ones at San Quentin nine. The other thing. Um, that he did not tell the guys in County that he told the guys in San Quentin was Trish was not his first victim that I should be looking into two more before Trish. Wow. Mm -hmm. And he's petrified to go back to Illinois because he's scared. They're going to also connect the, those two prior to him with Trish. Yeah. As well as the ones on route. Yeah. Well, he's, he's not getting out of San Quentin. He's, well, I mean, he is. He's in Cook County. I know, but like right now, but I mean, are they going to, is he going to serve the time in Illinois or is he going to serve the time? Because he still has, he has, uh, he's not through his charge in, in California. Right. I mean, he has, yeah, he's on death row in California. Yeah. yeah. So this is just basically closing out the case. Right, right, right. So why would he be worried at this point? He's never getting out. You know, all these guys in their head they think they're going to beat it somehow, you know? I guess so. They I mean, really that one thing that David Carpenter, when he still thinks he's getting out. <laughs> 94. 94. Yeah. 
He wouldn't he wouldn't tell you certain things because his lawyer told him not to tell him because he's still working on his case. And, you know, especially with Michael Gargiulo, um, he gets off on the press that Ashton, like the pr bad press that yeah. Ashton Kutcher is getting. Because, you know, it's, it does. It's like, oh, well, maybe there there is something there. There isn't. But he wants people to believe that. It gives him hope, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm but, sure. I'm sure he's just sitting there hearing about this Diddy stuff and goes, oh, we, we, exactly. maybe. Exactly. Exactly. You know? Yeah. No, for sure. He is. Yeah. All right. So he's in there. He's he's blabbing his mouth. He's bragging. Mm -hmm. always nothing. Then you're getting intel from these other serial killers and they're telling right. you. Well, Michael had no idea. Mm -hmm. He had no idea. So I was playing along with, you know, you're innocent. Tell me why. You know, take me through your case. Send me yeah. your recovery. You know, I'm playing along with um, his game. That's what I'm doing. He had no idea that I had all this intel from the inmates who had come to me with this information. At the time, I didn't even want to take him on. You know, I had so many at the time um, that I was working. And they're like, no, you have to because this girl Trish is back there. There's two before her. There's ones in route. And then um, I hear this PSA from you know, the investigators in Los Angeles saying, yeah, there, there's seven more on route that we're trying to figure out if anybody has any information come forward. And I'm like, wow. So yeah. there's still girls out there who had been murdered by him, but no and one. Two others in Illinois. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he started really young. Yeah. I mean, he was 17 with Trish. Wow. That is really young for a serial killer. It's not unheard of. Uh, Bundy supposedly started at 17 as well. Yeah, and also um, uh, Gary Ridgway started. Like, I think he killed a kid in the woods or he stabbed him. I don't know if the kid ended up dying, but he ended up stabbing him in the woods when I think it was like, uh, I think it was like 13. The kid was yeah. like six or something like that. Makes sense. Bittaker told me he was 17, 18 his first time. So, yeah, I mean, some of them do start that young. Yeah. All right. So, Gargiulo, I mean, when is his trial again? Um, so, they just had another court session. When was it? The 20th. Mm -hmm. So, they're going forward, um, you know, with Trish. And um, I don't know any more details. I don't know if they have a date. I don't know yeah. what evidence they have. Um, I know it's a new DA who feels confident with the case. He wants to bring it forward on him. The big thing with Trisha's murder is the uh, DNA on her nails. Um, you know, Michael was a family friend. He was best friends with her little brother, Doug. Uh -huh. In the household, she drove in his car a lot. You know, could that DNA have come from that? Um, but, you know, her brothers and her parents testified that night before she even went out to hang out and do that scavenger hunt with her friend, mm -hmm. very long, hot shower. She was constantly like in the sh taking long, hot showers, washing her hands. There would have been no, she didn't encounter Michael that night during the scavenger hunt. There is absolutely no reason why his DNA should have been anywhere on her. Yeah. And I mean, I can't see why it would be under her fingernails. Can't imagine what her family has to go through. And then I can't remember. Have you spoken to the family at all? Not yet. Not yet. Um, I have some tapes. And I got to say, you know, in all my years, 10 years of working with serial killers, it takes a lot to really shock me or give me chills. And I got to say, Michael Gargiulo, um, there were times I got off the phone with him and another serial killer would call and they would hear it in my voice of like how shaken I was. Yeah. Um, because I, you know, I typically don't see them talking, you know, just shit about the family or attacking the family so viciously. Mm -hmm. And Gargiulo would, he would attack the victims. He would attack huh. Michelle. And I have a lot of tapes. In like what way? Like he was just bashing them or is like, you know, or the fact that he felt like she did, they deserve it. Um, yeah. Like with, or they're, or they're full of shit. I can't believe they think I've done this. 
along those lines, but way more extreme. Mm -hmm. uh, just degrading them. Yeah. And um, it would just give me chills, especially because I would say, well, okay, well, who, who do you think killed Trish? And he would be like, her brother, Doug. And I was just like, really? Like, I knew he killed her. But it's like, you really want to look, you want to point the finger at her own brother? Yeah. Who yeah. And he had a breakdown after her death because he felt responsible because he was friends with Michael. Oh. Uh. You know, like, imagine that guilt. And then this monster wants to turn around and point the finger at him. Oh. Mars is just a gaslighting right there. It's just sick. It was really sick. Some of the tapes I have with him are just really sick. Um, another one of the tapes I have is we would do like a quid pro quo. I would say I do this with a lot of them. It's like mm -hmm. off. Yeah, we're eventually going to listen to these tapes, right? You're gonna... Yeah, yeah, yeah. We will. But I said, you know, um, I would ask a question, they would ask a question. So the question they would, uh, one question Michael asked me was, what metal would I lick if I could lick a metal? And I was like, that is the weirdest question. I've what ever metal? Heard. Yeah. Yeah. That's bizarre, right? Yeah. Well, you got a crazy person. Well, yeah. But he starts, but he did it in like a, a sinister way. And he starts mm -hmm. talking about the, um, smell and taste of copper and i knew he was kind of like baiting me because obviously copper is blood he will report you know the smell of blood is like copper so he's talking about the smell and taste of copper yeah i didn't know that i didn't know that the smell of copper and the smell of blood are similar yeah yeah I had no idea that. oh yeah so when he said it i instantly was like okay now you're just playing with me and he would talk about um, the arteries all the time. He would talk about like the corroded artery, but then he would also talk about the femoral artery, but he would mm -hmm. always mispronounce it, which I thought was really strange, but he was actually really obsessed with the femoral artery, like mm -hmm. always talking about it. And in one conversation, I thought it was um, eerie. He talks about, he goes, do you know if a heart stops pumping and you flick it, it'll start pumping again. Yeah, well, yeah, he was so, fascinated the way how he can make all that stop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because so the way he's, he's talking about it very mechanically, very mechanically, you know, yeah. the femoral and those are the major arteries, the fem femoral and the carotid. I mean, those are the ones that, you know, and if you look at all the autopsy reports, those are the art. He went all straight for the arteries. Mm hmm. Yeah. For both, both the carotid and the... All of them. Yeah. Of them. It was just like he was stabbing at every artery. Yeah. He wanted to make sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I actually, funny enough, I went to Wayne, Adam Ford. Yes. And just like I did, I go to him a lot. But mm -hmm. <laughs> I said to him, like, some, I didn't tell him it was Michael Gargiulo because he was actually housed very close to him. But I told him, I go, he's asking me about what metal I would lick. Um, talking about the copper and Wayne was like blood. I was like, right. And um, it was funny because right when he said, what metal would you look? I instantly said knife, like just knowing where his thought was going. Yeah. And he lit up like a Christmas tree when I said that. And I said to Wayne, I go, what do you make of that? And he goes, he goes, I think he licked the knives of the blood of the girls. Mm-hmm. He goes, that's what, that's what I'm getting. He goes, because you know what? Cannibalism or licking the blood, that's total possession of the victim. You're taking their life force right there. Yeah. And I was like, right, right. And, and from the, another serial killer, Wayne Adam Ford, gave right. me that little piece of information. Yeah. He was said, it, I, was it based on experience or is it just based upon? How he just feels like he knows how this guy's mind works. Both. Both. Okay. Yeah. And Wayne said, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if he drank some of the blood. Mm -hmm. And then Wayne said, you know, if he's asking you what metal you would lick, he goes, 
I wouldn't be surprised if he made the victims actually lick their own blood. Before they were dead or just while they were dead? Before, like as a sadistic torture. You know, I'll stop if you do this for power control. Do you think he's had, he had that much time to where he, they were, I mean, I know we're getting to really details here, but I'm just, just trying I mean, to figure he, out. He, he did have hours before these victims were found. Oh, okay. Yeah. He could have taken his time and done more than we know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I really feel for that family because they're going to have to relive this whole thing again. Yeah. I can't even imagine. Um, the other thing was with Michael was that, uh, so when he was at the end of the driveway, do you remember last week I was talking yeah. about how her father found her? He was, he said, find out who did this. Um, you know, at the time when I had heard the, this information, it didn't make sense until I had heard this part about it. Mm -hmm. he him find out who did it because, um, the death row inmates came to me and they said, you have to figure out who he's trying to frame for Trisha's murder. And I was like, what do you mean? They, that's when I learned the information that he had planted Trisha's murder weapon on a mutual friend of him and Doug's. And he, there's a big story about him going to. And when did he plant this, in, this evidence? Right before, so he went to Trisha's parents' house. Oh, before he did the murder? No, no, this is after. Oh, after, okay. This is after. He knocked on the door and he had said, um, he Trisha's mom opened it and she was like, hi, Michael. And he was like, I need to talk to Mr. Picaccio. And she goes, well, he's at work. Why don't you come sit in the kitchen? I talked about last week. Mm -hmm. Sat in the kitchen for an hour. And then finally he came home. But right when he came home and walked in to see Michael, Michael's dad and sister came and pulled him out of the kitchen. Yeah. Um, I remember I said the sister knew. Yeah. And the family. They, yeah, they knew. They Not knew. only the sister, they all knew. They all knew, right. Um, but I also think the sister knew exactly what he was going to do right then and there. And that's why mm -hmm. she also pulled him out. Um, he had planted the murder, Trisha's murder weapon on this friend. Do you know who the friend is? I have a first name. I don't want to say it on air, but um, okay. yeah, I, it's been given to law enforcement, of course. Oh, okay. So they know. Yeah, because you know, I, what? God forbid, I kept thinking, you know, God forbid, even now he tries to like turn around and say, no, no, it wasn't me. It was this guy. I can even tell you where it was planted. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but that was the whole plan behind that. Wow. Yeah. So that's all being used today in this in this trial. Well, I don't think, yeah, pretty much. I don't know if they're going to go into that whole aspect of him trying to frame somebody. Yeah. Um, but I, I do know there are new witnesses coming forward for the new trial. Well, that's good. Let's hope they just wrap this thing up. I mean, it's horrible. That, I know. That, that poor family. I can't even yeah. imagine. Yeah. Because you got to think, I mean, he was seven years old, six, seven years old when he, you know, became best friends with Doug, her little brother. Yeah. Household. Well, I mean, you can relate to that. You have yeah. that in your family. I mean, you know, you have no idea sometimes what's underneath your. Right. Right. Your own family underneath the same roof. I know. It's just like, you don't know what's going. You never really know what's going on. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. It's scary. Yeah. All right. So that's, that's happening. And, um, what other stuff has, has he talked about in these interviews that some of these recordings give us some, give us some like headlines. Okay. Well, besides for licking of blood and smell of copper, that's a, that's a pretty big headline. <laughs> I mean, yeah, he's, I mean, the big Listen, thing, I'm glad I, I mean, that's the first time I've ever heard that before though, the whole copper and blood mm -hmm. smelling the same thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I had no idea. The second he said, I was like, oh my God, he's talking about blood. Yeah. He, he was obsessed with blood, obsessed with blood and 
you know, every artery, he would talk about it like all the time. But the first thing he would talk about was, you know, the death row inmates told me they were like, he's going to try to put you in his dungeon, which I talked about. Um, yes. The whole dungeon thing. What do you mean his dungeon? And he did. He, he was like, oh, you're going to be in my dungeon. And he would write these texts of like, you're going to get on your knees and be in my dungeon. And I was like, what? Yeah. Did he actually have a dungeon somewhere? Yeah. It was like a fantasy dungeon. It was a fantasy. So it wasn't like, you know, there in Ing and Lake where they actually had a dungeon. No. Well, God, I hope not. <laughs> but I mean, really, I mean, he didn't have a place of his own. So I was going to say, yeah, he only lived off of females. So he was couch surfing. Right. Um, but no, I think it was just like a big sexual fantasy thing for him. But he mm -hmm. had girls writing to him, like playing into this dungeon fantasy of his. Oh, I'm sure he's got plenty of fans. Does he have like people that write to him? Yeah, yeah. That, that yeah. just amazes me. I mean, you know, I know you talk to him all the time, but you're you have a reason to be talking to him, right? Right. These people just want to be entertained, either entertained or they just want like they want a relationship. It's yeah. They're not even that interesting, <laughs> like <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> Trust me, I've interviewed them all. They're not that interesting. They're really not. They're pretty boring. I mean, yeah. And insecure. But that was Michael's big thing was the dungeon. And, you know, I had to side swipe that quick mm -hmm. because the girls were playing into it. And that's when I wrote him back. I sent him a picture of me with a big dungeon, like as a yeah. joke. I said, get in my dungeon. That was smart. Yeah. So that's how I started. And then, you know, I mean, but also a little, were you a little apprehensive of what his reaction would be? Or did you no, know what his reaction was? No, because I know like how scared these guys are. Like they're all cowards. So I knew it would intimidate him. But also, cowards. There's, there's a title. They're cowards. Exactly. No, they really are. So I knew it would not only um, intrigue him, but also intimidate him, which is what I wanted to do, mm -hmm. which is what worked, you know? And at this point, you know, even when I, when I've gone to some pretty other infamous SKs, like just recently BTK, he was like, "Hi, Siren and San Quentin." Mm -hmm. So there's no real hiding anymore mm -hmm. from these guys. Like they know exactly who I am. They know exactly yeah. why I'm here. Oh yeah, word's gotten around. I'm yeah, sure. they all know who I am. There's like I think every serial killer at this point knows who I am. Mm -hmm. um, they know what I'm coming for too. So you know, I don't use. So I'm kind of just on front at this point. You know, you want to be part of the study? Do you want to help yeah. me do this, that? I just cut through the bullshit, you know? Yeah. That's what it is. I'm not I'm not here to just, you know. Well, in the beginning, you were you were gathering data. Right, right. Well, yeah. And now you have so much data. Now I have two. You realized you know, <laughs> you've had all these conversations, hours and hours of speaking right. with these guys in cages and on phones and little mm -hmm. iPads and stuff like that. So you you know what to edit out in your conversation is very right. easy now. I've kind of, you know, I put them like, now I'm just at the point where it's like, if I'm going to answer the phone, mm -hmm. you know, you better like deliver. I'm not just going to get on the phone and talk about the weather. Exactly. I don't, hear, I don't care. hear you complain. Exactly. I don't care what you're eating in prison. I don't care how your day is. I'm going to be honest with you. I just don't care. Like if I'm getting on the phone, I have, so much on my plate at this point, like we have to be working, you know, and I, mm -hmm. you know, I make it very clear to them too. And, um, how does that feel? Cause like in the beginning, I mean, you were just, you were like, you know, you had, you had to finesse your way in and also you didn't know what their reactions were going to be. Right. I mean, you, know, always, you, you have so much more, you know, such more of a baseline of these guys' personalities and how they think. And so now you can kind of, you know, you, you, you're inside their head. Oh, yeah, completely. Like, I can actually, like, think about exactly what they're going to say next, too. And I'll say it before they do. And they're like, how did you? And I'm like, I just know you at this point. Exactly. Even Gargiulo, I barely knew him. But I knew when he was going for, you know, the copper. And he said, what would you lick? And I was like, knife. And, like, he lit up. And I was like, yeah, because you." Want I knew exactly what you were thinking. And I was going to say it before. 
you know, it's just like you start to get on that wavelength with them. Mm -hmm. You know, you hear it from when you work with so many of them, especially after 10 years, it's like you're already there. Yeah. You know exactly what they're going to say. How do you, I mean, listen, I mean, you, you, you have a lot of information in your head based on these guys. How do you discharge that? Like when you have to not think about it anymore or just go to sleep or do you discharge it? I, yeah, definitely. I mean, how many come down from that? You know, it's hard. Like I would say probably the first couple of years, it was really hard. Like I didn't know how to compartmentalize it. Actually a funny story. So when I first started interviewing, I started going to, sounds so weird. I started going to a playground at night and swinging on the swings. I used to okay. love swing on the swings as a child. I'm sure, yeah, they're just kind of rhythmic and. The- right, and I went to, it was a spiritual class, um, and I had told somebody there, I go, you know, I just started interviewing serial killers, and for some reason, every night, like around 10 p.m. till 12 a.m., I'll just go swing on the swings, pitch black, you know, at a playground. It sounds so weird. It's a huge target for any budding serial killer. <laughs> right? Some chick just swinging on the swings. Uh, but they said to me, they're like, oh, that's you holding on to that last bit of innocence that you have. You're going back to your child. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And I was like, oh, that, yeah, it makes perfect sense. And I go, yeah. then they go, but it'll stop. And I was like, oh, once all my innocence is fully gone, they're like, yeah. And it did yeah. stop. It did yeah. stop. But yeah, in the beginning, that's what I used to do. I would go swing on the swings. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just so, I mean, and just before we had to delay this podcast, because you had an emergency call from one of them. Yeah. You know? They and were that, saying somebody. Yeah. Yeah. So that's so funny that they call you when such stuff happens to them. Yeah. Well, they're doing all the prisons. Sorry, that's my cat. <laughs> Going nuts. Um, not a serial killer. Um, serial cat. Serial cat. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah. So right now in the California prisons are actually doing like um, searches of all the death row inmates because there's been a huge increase of porn, drugs, weapons, and cell phones. I just how do they get cell phones in there? I mean, I couldn't get. I mean, we. Yeah, I don't know. I well, I do know. Um, I remember that was the first thing, you know, when I was in, I used to do that series lock up in one of the first prisons. I was so astonished. I'm walking around, I'm smelling weed. And I'm like, what? Yeah. Smelling weed. Last, actually, when the last time I was going to San Quentin, this this guy was walking and he smelled, he reeked a weed. And like the CO was like, did you smoke? And he's like, yeah, in the parking lot. (laughs) Yeah. It's just so bizarre. Used at the stuff that goes down um, in the prison. Amazed, yeah. Yeah. So, what is it? What is it like up there now? Is there anybody left up there? Yeah, Ford is still there. Um, Joe Danks, another serial killer um, from LA, still there. Marlo is still there. Marlo, yeah. Mm-hmm. He just sent me a message too. Uh, he wrote a new book, a manuscript. He wants me to look. <laughs> Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. He, he's one of those those serial killers, though. I mean, you know, we we're talking about cowards. He, mm-hmm. I don't think he falls into the coward category. No, no, he doesn't. Yeah, he's, like, he's a downright predator. Like you know. Yeah. Like a, yeah, and you know, I really want to follow up. I really want to find an expert on this electroshock therapy because there was another death row inmate who also came to me and swears by it, just like Marlo, mm-hmm. and. I was talking to Ford. I was like, do you think there's anything to it? He goes, he goes, I've seen guys change going through it. And I was like, really? How could you not change? You got like all that voltage going through you. I mean, yeah. The rewiring. I mean. Yeah. I don't, I don't know, know why they don't try like, I mean, Ibogaine or something. Oh, like that. About, yeah. the. Remember we were talking about that? They, yeah. You know, I mean, that does the same thing without. Are they, exactly. Mm-hmm. And, um, are they doing it anywhere else, like outside the U.S., treatment of those of inmates with, like, psychotropics to try to rewire their brain? No, I mean, like I said, there was the one guy in Canada who got shut down. But I mean, oh, yeah, he, yeah, yeah. he went to the extreme. He did the whole entire prison, which is just 
crazy. So I feel like, you know, I really think it would be great to try it. With yeah. I really think, you know, if we're doing electric shock therapy, why aren't we trying something like that? I know that's the, the, the ridiculous thing about the medical community. They'll, they'll, they'll do electric shock therapy, like thousands of volts through your brain, right. you know, right. and although they won't try like psychotropics, yeah. which have no right. residual effect other than just internally rewiring your brain. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, we got to get an expert on to talk about that for sure. Cause okay. I think we're both really intrigued by that. I am. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just, I don't know. I mean, I just, just seeing the re most recent studies, what they've done with like, you know, um, you know, people that have been in war, PTSD, right. That were like suicidal and, you know, and they go down and you can do it. There's a clinic down in Mexico. I guess they all go to, Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. There's been a couple. I've, I've seen a couple interviews with some, um, you know, servicemen who've had really bad, bad PTSD and have went and did it and it's changed their lives. And like in a very, very short period of time, too. Yeah. You yeah. know, they'll be down there for like three days or four days. Yeah. And like I said, I mean, ayahuasca has an 80% cure rate for heroin addiction. I mean, that's. Insane. I didn't know that. Yeah, eighty percent, and you know, even they used to use it with um, DID, mm -hmm. um, because it would allow a psychiatrist to actually ex explore the trauma that was causing, you know, the split within the brain mm -hmm. of personalities. And it's like, why aren't we using this to explore people's trauma? Yeah. And you look at a, a serial killer who has trauma, especially from the childhood. Why aren't we using it to, you know, explore that trauma within a criminal yeah. or a serial killer? You know, if, if we can get to the root of the problem, maybe that can fix it. But we're yeah. not doing, you know, the methods that we have that can, you know, help us explore that more. Yeah, I, know. I mean, it's helped. They use it for people who are like terminally ill, who right. try to get out of, you know, to, you know, because get out of that cycle of like doom and gloom thinking, mm -hmm. and depression, and it, and it works for them. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty crazy. So, um, all right. So Gargiulo, what else about Gargiulo? Okay. So let me think back to more of my nonstop tapes with him. Um, let's see. Uh, okay. So with Michelle, I will say, um, he told me, uh, six different versions of why he was in her apartment because, you know, he can't escape the fact that <laughs> His blood is actually in her apartment. Oh, okay. So he's he's building. He's continually defending himself. Trying to, at least. Um, but I would say the the one that really stands out of all the different stories he's told is that um, she was stabbing herself, and he heard her screaming, and he ran into her apartment to try to stop her from stabbing herself, and got cut in the process and ran out. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's a pretty bold, bold, bold statement. Bold story. Same as Ashton Kutcher is the serial killer. I would have loved, I can't wait to hear him explain that. I want to hear his tone. I want to hear his pitch. I have all the tapes of it. Yeah. Oh, I can't wait to hear that. Yeah. That's crazy. Um, I actually made some memes. Like, the victim is responsible for the victim's death. She was stabbing herself in the middle of the night. Stabbing herself. Okay. Because that's how a female would even try to. Exactly. Right. 26 year old girl. Yeah. Uh, crazy. And her screens were cut open. Yeah. Yeah. She's good. Yeah. She did that beforehand. Beforehand. Right. To right. make it seem like he, that Gargiulo killed him. She set him up. Yeah. And I said, you know, okay, so if you're walking by and heard her screaming, and thought, okay, I'm going to go help her. How did you know what apartment it was? How did you know where to go into? How did you, like, she's in an apartment complex. That makes no sense at all. You, you would know exactly where she was in the apartment. But nobody else around that apartment complex came out or tried to help. Mm -hmm. Like, you're, nothing he ever said made any sense. Um, he tried to blame Maria's murder on the ex-husband. Yeah. What, what other, 
his particular personality does it because i'm sure like there's some parallels between some of the serial killers they have some commonalities in the way they do things who does he have any commonalities with any other serial sure. killers or is he he sounds like he sounds pretty you know in some aspects he does and then other aspects he seems he's kind of unique in a way He's very unique, I, I gotta say. Well, the first thing, you know, when the death row inmates came to me and said, you gotta talk to him, they go, he is a spiritual sadist. And I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> what? And they're like, no, he talks about religion and, you know, prophecies and all this type mm-hmm. of stuff, jumbo, jumbo, whatever. And I was like, but then he talks about dungeons. And I was like, wait, <laughs> what? So mm-hmm. what he, what, Gargiulo did not know is that I'm very close with a cult leader, a killer cult leader. Okay. Who knows the Bible, you know, memorized everything. And um, I had him on the phone. Gargiulo had no idea. And he's spewing all this spiritual stuff or trying to, or at least. Gargiulo was? Yeah. Yeah. And he hangs up and I go, what do you make of it? He goes, it's all bullshit. He goes, he's read a couple of lines from this book, this book, this book. Yeah, he's a poser. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He was like, he doesn't know anything about what he's talking about. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so it's just kind of an act he does. All an act, yeah. Yeah. I guess it would it would serve him well inside prison. People stay away from him if they think he's completely crazy. He, they don't think he's crazy, but he was a, you know, a lot of the reports of him is like boasting. Like he, he tells everybody that he was a multimillionaire in LA. Yeah. His actor. Brother, he was an actor. He was an actor, boxer. Um, his yeah. brother was his best friend owns Paramount Studios. His brother's working for Paramount Studios. They were <laughs> working for you guys know who. Um, but yeah, um, they're making all these big movies, blah blah blah. You know, mm-hmm. he had Super Bowl rings from Tom Brady. It was always, you know, he always wore Prada, Gucci, um, but he's working as a plumber, living off of girls. So pathological liar, it's like John Lovitz. Yeah. On Saturday Night Live. Yeah. Everything. He's just the, he's the biggest and best at everything he does, you know? So what was their take on him, all the other serial killers? Did they think he's just a, is that, did they have the same impression? Well, you know, if you do that kind of stuff in prison, like you talk like that and you're all bullshit, you know, they, they sniff you out quick. So, I mean, a lot of the guys just wanted to beat him up just for, for running. The to shut him up. Stupid. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, How often does that happen on death row? A lot. A lot. I mean, you're lucky if you just get beat up on death row, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. No, they'll just, they'll take you out. They'll stab you. Has it happened to any of the ones that you're talking to? Have they gotten? I know no. obviously not taken out, but they've gotten beaten up or gotten to it. Yeah, some a lot of them have been stabbed too. Yeah, it seems um, to be the method there. Getting shanked. Getting shanked. Yep. Crazy. Has, uh, is Gargiulo? Has he been pretty pretty uh, safe inside prison, or has he been? So far, but I mean, now he's in Cook County, which is <laughs> he's in Cook County Jail, right? He's not in Cook County, yeah. So that's where he is. Um, I think that's a big reason why he is faking that he had two aneurysms and a stroke, and now he's a walker. Um, because he even said to me like he was petrified of Cook County. That's a bad place. It's it's no joke. Yeah, it's like LA County. LA County is no joke either. Yeah. L.A. County, Cook County. I think Cook County is probably worse than L.A. Yeah, County. probably. Yeah. Um, that's why I think he's kind of faking everything right now. Um, I think he's really scared. I mean, he told me he was very, very scared of Cook County going back there. So, yeah, it'll be. How long have you been back there now? Two weeks. Oh, just two weeks. Yeah. Yeah. And he's going to be there for a while. Yeah, I mean, for a trial, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's probably going to be a long, I don't know. I would imagine. Are they televising that trial? Do you know? What? I did. They, I can't remember if they televised in, in uh, Chicago, in Illinois. 
I don't, I don't know. Um, the first arraignment he had, they only had sketches of him in the courtroom. Oh, then I guess they don't allow crime. So I don't know. I don't know if they will for the trial. Um, yeah, I don't know if they will for the trial. But, you know, I think after 31 years, you know, I think it's time, you know, he finally gets to, you know, some justice for Trisha and her family. Yeah, waiting yeah for her poor family. Yeah. I mean, and and just put him from, you know, in an uncomfortable situation where he has to sit in Cook County Jail for the whole time. Yeah, exactly. And, well, you know, you know mean, he's you a know. high value target. I mean. Oh, he's a mantelpiece, mm -hmm. you know, in Cook County. Yeah. He definitely is. Yeah. Special guest star mm -hmm. from L.A. That's weird. It's yeah. such a weird, like. We, it's like everybody knows what really goes on inside there, but you, it, it really doesn't seem real. No, it's, it's no one knows. I mean, you know, cause you've been inside and I've been inside these places and it's just, it's, it's a thousand times worse than you think it is. Oh, a thousand times worse. People wow. don't realize how dangerous it is. Yeah. Everybody, you know, people have the Hollywood perception of it. You know, you're there with the phone. Yeah. And there's a guard right now. Everybody thinks I have private security when I go and I'm like, oh my God. No. If you only no. knew. Right. No. It's nothing like you see in the movies. It's really dangerous, mm -hmm. especially county. I mean, they're you're out in the open in county. Well, yeah, county, because there's like no one's programmed. They're just all kind of just waiting to be moved around and they're moved around. They don't have a they don't have their own space. They usually, you know, double, triple them up and it's depending upon the jail, but it's just, it's just a way station for them. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, but I am going to, you know, look into other murders prior to Trish. Yeah. And routes from, you know, Illinois to L.A., yeah, I didn't. I, we didn't talk about that the last time that there. I guess that's why we were just going to get to it when you were talking about it today. But the fact that there is two other priors, that's kind of. Yeah, two oh. other priors. Well, you know, um, I can't say the name of who, but I have the other one who has priors in that other state that Rob and I have been swamped with. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And then there's still Bitteker you know, looking into all of his. So it's just like, it's always mounting with all of them. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, well, there's two more possible here. Oh, well, there's five more possible here. Yeah. It's never ending with, okay, I got to look here. I got to look there. And I mean, you can't stop. I mean, you know, people have lost their lives. And I know. I know. It's amazing what you and Rob are doing. That's it's fantastic. Yeah. I mean, because no one else is doing it. Yeah, we were. Maybe there, there may be some people out there like yourself, you know, some other people that are taking on things, but not at the scale that you're doing. No, we took a call. It, I got it was been one or two a.m. the other night, and I was just like, I called. And I was like, "Are you ready?" And he's just like, "Guess so." And we were up until five taking that call. Wow. And I mean, we got a ton of information on some mm -hmm. unknown numbers, but I mean, yeah. It's just, you never know what's going to come in. Yeah. What's going to come in. <laughs> it, yeah. Yeah. It's a lot. Yeah. Crazy stuff. All right. So um, you're going to start digging through those recordings and we can start listening to them. Yeah. So next yeah. week. I we'll think we've built up enough of him. Suspense. <laughs> exactly. Because I want to hear him. Yeah. Cindy, want to hear him? She's yeah, still she does. She does. <laughs> She's here in spirit. She said yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll get the tapes ready for next week. So I know. Okay, cool. Here. All right, Laura. Well, listen, you have a good night. Thanks for staying up with us. No problem. All right. Take care. Night, guys. Um, 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 um.